everyone, my name is Chris Catola. I'm the Head Field Research Coordinator for Fauna Forever. Fauna Forever is an NGO based in Peru. We conduct most of our research in the southeastern part of the country, in the Madre de Dios region. In fact, I'm currently recording this on the riverbank of the Tambapata River as we speak. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Global South Bats for inviting me to record this video. It's always a pleasure to talk about bats and very exciting to talk about new research relating to bats. Okay, so the paper that I've chosen to talk about is entitled A Systematic Review of Myotis from Chile Using Molecular, Morphological, and Bioacoustic Data. And with a title like that, you can imagine it has a large team behind it. Uh, the lead author is Roberto Leonin Noveas. Um, I won't go into all the other authors' names because I'll probably butcher the names <laughs> and also it'll probably take a long time, but it, uh, there's many people that were behind this amazing paper. Um, also, as a lot of us know, uh, systematic reviews are very important. Uh, it's important that we understand the diversity of life on this planet, obviously. And also these types of papers and these taxonomic revisions and reviews are very important for conservation, as we know, because once we understand species and their ranges, we can often identify potential populations that are small or fragmented and under potential risks from human activities, such as mining and climate change, etc. So these papers are important. But I think we also know some of them can be a little dry. They can be 10, 20, 30, 40 pages long. And of course, science doesn't have to always be exciting in a page turner, but sometimes these are a bit of a slog to get through. And I think we, we can acknowledge that. But this one is particularly interesting to me for a couple of reasons. The first reason, personally, is that I'm really fascinated by bats along the west coast of South America. I do work here in the Amazon, and we have you know, where I work, about 120 species of bats that could be here, so there's plenty of diversity, and they're amazing. But even though there's lower diversity on the west coast of South America, it's a very harsh environment, and it's really impressive that there's bat species able to live there and, and, and thrive there. And what they feed on, how they reproduce, where they roost, these are all really interesting questions that I find personally very stimulating. Uh, I've gotten the chance to visit there and do a little quick research for a week or so before, um, I'd love to do more in the future. I just find it a very fascinating area to understand bats and their diversity and their life history. So that's a personal reason. And then I guess the scientist in me enjoys this paper because um, it really takes a three-pronged approach to trying to delineate these species. It's not, not, not um, single facet, it's not one direction. There's three different aspects to this. And I think that's really interesting and very smart for the authors to do that. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things I like about this paper is how the team came to the conclusion that there are three species of myotis within the borders of Chile. Now, on a purely genetic basis, there's really no doubt that myotis atacamensis is a separate species from myotis chiloensis. There's significant difference genetically. I don't think anybody's really doubting that. But myotis chiloensis and myotis aerosans are actually very similar genetically. There's approximately 2% difference between these two species. Now, in many cases, a difference of only 2% would not be enough to justify the separation of species, and instead they'd often be left together as a subspecies, one another. But this team took an interesting approach by looking at two other types of data, morphological and acoustic data. And based on those in conjunction with genetic data, it's enough to separate them. Morphologically, there are differences in the crani uh, cranial differences, and there's also some pretty significant differences in the fur, okay? And acoustically, there are statistically significant differences in the call structure, the end frequencies in particular, between these species. So what you have are features that generally don't vary within individuals very much, that all come together to show this is a set, these are two separate species. Another interesting fact is that within the species, there was a less than 0.02% variation within these samples that were assigned to either species. So that basically for me, further proves that these are distinct populations. Now, a couple other things I really like about this paper, um, for starters, is I really feel like we're getting a bit of a snapshot of evolution right here. Um, Myotis aerosans, Myotis chiloensis, again, genetically quite similar to each other right now, but as selective pressures continue to push them in their respective areas and in their respective regions of habitat and regions of Chile, um, very likely over the next you know, hundreds and thousands of years, they'll continue to diverge and continue to separate and, and generate more distance genetically from each other. Um, so it's very interesting to sort of get a window into that right now. And one of the things, again, I like about the paper is that utilizing um, other aspects of morphological and bioacoustic, we're able to say, I believe, with pretty strong confidence, these are separate species right now, and yet still see how similar they are to each other genetically. So I really like uh, to get that sort of snapshot into evolution and action that this paper provides to us. 
Now, another interesting result to come from this paper is the similarities morphologically between Myotis atacamensis and Myotis aerosens. And they also share some very similar features with a third species of Myotis in the western part of South America, the west, west coast of South America, which is Myotis bakery. Now, Myotis bakery is not from Chile. It's found in Peru. But all three of these species have a variety of similar morphological features, including ear shape and most noticeably fur color. They have a very sort of palish color, frosted, quite pretty coloration actually. Now, the interesting thing is that Atacamensis and Aerosans are related. They are separate species clearly, but you can tell genetically they're, sim they're reasonably similar. But Myotis bakery actually is a different lineage. It is definitely not closely related, and yet they share the same features. So this is a good example of convergent evolution, and it's obvious that the pressures of living in an arid, rocky, semi-desert or desert environment is pushing these species to develop these features. And that's in contrast to Myotis chiloensis, which of course is a much browner bat and lives and forages in more wooded areas. So of course we understand that you know, foraging strategies and the habitat associated with it um, has a big influence on morphology of species, we all know that. But it's still really interesting to see that occurring within one genus simply along the west coast of South America. You know, this is a really interesting little micro, microcosm of convergent evolution in a relatively small area. So in conclusion, this paper is very interesting for a variety of reasons, um, but I think it is a good example to everyone who's working on taxonomy and trying to identify species uh, across the whole world and in particular understudied regions such as the Neotropics, Africa and Asia, all the tropical zones of trying to take a multifaceted approach to this task, to this project. Um, simply looking at genetics, simply looking at morphology, simply using acoustics, uh, it may not be enough in many cases to really parse out when there is a species there, a more cryptic species there. So I really applaud the authors for, for using a multifaceted approach to this. And I think this, again, we, as I stated at the beginning, this is very relevant for conservation. Understanding and identifying these species is something we really need to work toward doing. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, they, these authors have done a great job of identifying these species in this paper. So once again, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Global South Bats for giving me the opportunity to record this video. I'd like to also say a big thank you, gracias, obrigado to everyone for taking the time to watch it. And yeah, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, happy batting.